Oh, good morning, ma'am. How are you? Just to start. Showtime. Yes, sir. Good morning. Let's try that one more time. Good morning. Who's having a great day so far? All right, welcome to Sunday School class. Now we've been going through a series of what I'm calling spooky religions. And we're going to touch on a very interesting one today. Um, we're going to talk about nihilism. Who knows what nihilism is? Heard of it. Okay. Any guess at what that means? Who knows what? N Go ahead. Yes, sir. It's the philosophy that everything is just not worth anything and that it's all going to go to nothing. So. It's the philosophy that everything is pretty much worth nothing and it's all going to go to nothing. Right? To paraphrase Brother Ross. And that's about right. Nile means nothing. Uh, there's a phrase within Christianity now. It's called uh, Nile. Annihilationism, annihilationism, and what's it based on? Well, it's based on pagan philosophy that nothing matters; it's all pointless. Now, nihilism is closely related to uh, predestination, as Calvinists would teach it, in the sense of uh, it's also called fatalism. You have no choice. There is no free will. We're not going to talk about those two sides of it today. What we are going to talk about is the fact that at the end, there is something, right? Now, this time of year, uh, earlier in the month, I preached against Halloween. Yes, I preached against that sacred cow, okay? Uh, the Halloween is not a Christian holiday. There's nothing good or godly about it. I didn't go too far into it, but the origins of it are, are actually satanic. They were pagans that would come by and trouble the Christians and do the trick or treat. Give us one of your children or we're going to burn your whole house down. Or they would take somebody and make them bob for apples in boiling water and hopefully they lived through it without losing their eyeballs. They would have a jack-o'-lantern full of flesh like boiling flesh. I mean, there's some really bizarre things they would do. It is satanic. It's changed names over time. Sal Wynn and then the Catholics, as they often adopt pagan cultures wherever they move. Um, they, you know, All Saints Day, All Hallows Day, Halloween as it's commonly called today. Now, Halloween is glorifying the devil. And really it's glorifying hell. All of you have probably noticed this house down the road here. Maybe I'll go down there and make a little video of it because it's quite the spectacle, isn't it? I have not seen a house as decked out for Halloween anywhere I've ever lived, anywhere in Jacksonville. Has anybody seen anything more than that one? Brother Jake, if you haven't seen it, you've got to go down the end of the road. It's not very far. Yeah, giant spider on the roof. You saw it. Giant spiders on the roof and all these corpses and graves and all this bizarre stuff. And here's the title of my sermon today. Halloween is not a joke. Or, or maybe I should say it like this. Hell is not a joke. There is something at the end of everyone's life. And if you're saved, if you've trusted on Jesus, He paid for all of your sins. He took that punishment. And He wants to give you the free gift of everlasting life. And hell is not a joke. If you would, go to Deuteronomy chapter 32 with me. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and I know some people were actually offended that I dared to preach against Halloween. How can you? Don't you know it's not that bad? It's just kids having fun. Come on, it's just candy. Hell is not a joke. Hell should not be celebrated. Fools make a mock at sin. There are many scoffers that, that, you know, the, uh, that deny that there's a God. And this is one of their holidays. You know, we, we've spoken about the Freemasons and their ties to the Mormons. And with Mormonism, you know, one of their favorite holidays that I learned while I was in uh, Utah, at the time, it was Halloween. Absolute one. They love witches. They love witchcraft. They believe in a spirit world more so than they do in hell as we understand it. Um, you're in Deuteronomy 32. Let's take a look at the first two verses. Uh, verse number 1, it says, Give ear, O ye heavens, 
And I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Now think about it. God is saying, give ear. He's saying, pay attention. I'm going to teach you some doctrine. You say, what is doctrine? Well, that's your set of beliefs, if you will. Uh, we all have doctrine about different things. We have a, a doctrine about how we drive a car, if you really want to get nitty gritty. There are certain things you always do, I, you know, put on the seat belt, turn on the fog lights. I always put my indicator on before, or even if somebody is ahead of me, I'll put on my indicator as well. Like we have a certain doctrine, a set of beliefs about driving, a philosophy, if you will. Well, God has doctrines about things. And here in Deuteronomy 32, I believe in what's called the law of first mention. We're going to see the first mention of the word hell. Uh, if you would, look at verse number 15 with me. Deuteronomy 32 Verse number 15, but Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Now there he's talking about his people that were rejecting him. He says, but Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat and grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. That is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. It called him that earlier. Uh, he is our rock. He says he's the God of truth earlier in verse number four of this chapter. When he says he waxed fat, what he means is the blessings had poured out. The food was good. The security was good. They had everything they needed. And they said, oh, I've got everything I need. I don't need God. They begin to reject him. Now this happens when we go out and preach the gospel and we knock on certain neighborhoods. Uh, well, you go down to the uh, poor neighborhoods, and those people are usually humble and honest and searching for God. Let's say we go to Ponte Vedra or Nakatee. I mean, the houses start at 500000 and only go up from there. When you go to certain neighborhoods, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, oh, we're good. <laughs> we don't, we, we're good here. We don't need any of that. And what they mean to say is, we have God right where we want Him, not convicting our conscience. Usually the poor are more humble. God makes this point, I blessed my people, then they begin to reject me. So they reject the rock of their salvation. This is a salvational issue. If you're not saved, where will you go when you die? I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Let's try that again. Are you, are you guys awake? All right. Well, if you're not saved, where will you go when you die? Hell. This is not an exciting thing to say, but it's the truth. And as Jesus, I love you, I want to tell you the truth, right? Look at the next verse, verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. So God is angry. Uh, they're worshiping to other gods. Verse 17, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God. Now listen, any other religion that doesn't have the Lord Jesus Christ as God, it's devils. Every other religion, check the box, it's devils, right? He says, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. They're inventing new gods all the time, just like they are inventing new genders, right? Look at verse 18. Of the rock, that's Jesus, that begot thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. God your creator. Verse 19, and when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. That means he despised them, he was angry with them, he hated them, he counted them as an abomination, something that made him angry. It says, because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Now, God gets angry when a parent does not teach their children about God. He's given you those children so you can teach them about him. You think about heritage, it says children are an Heritage. You know what a heritage is? That's when one father gives another father something. Right? Uh, Brother Jake, you're going to give James something one day whenever you pass away, and by that time he should be a father. Well, the Father in Heaven has given you James right now. That's a heritage from God, and you have to answer to God for how you train him up, right? So, he, verse 20, he says, And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see that their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Okay, they've rejected their salvation. They've picked another God. God's angry with them. He says there is no faith. Remember, salvation has always been by faith. From the very beginning of time to the end of time, it will always be by faith. It never can be of works. Otherwise, why do we need Jesus? Jesus came down and He was perfect. 
He finished all the works. We trust in Him and His promise, and we get the gift of God, which is eternal life. So in Deuteronomy 32, when he ends there in verse 20, he says they're froward. That means crooked or perverse, or going away from God. Verse 21, let's continue. He says, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. Now, I use this, and here's a great example. Could you imagine if I came home, and there was a picture of some man on the wall in my house? And I said, what is this? And my wife said, that's my husband. And I said, excuse me, Mrs. Fannin, I'm your husband. And she says, no, 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 I like this husband better. I'll call him, now he's my husband. I would be a little jealous. You guys understand, right? And you ladies would probably feel the same way. How would one of you ladies feel if you, if you're, you came, like your, your husband's phone, he had some picture of some other strange woman that you didn't know? And he said, well, that's my wife. You'd say, excuse me, I'm your wife, right? Now, how do you think God felt when there was a generation that knew the Lord, they had the oracles of God, the scriptures, they were taught of God, and then they said, no, nope, we've got a new God, we're going to go worship Moloch, Baal, Ashtaroth. How do you think God felt? Do you think he was upset? Now, he is jealous for us, and listen, hell is not a joke. Look at the next verse. He says, for a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. This one verse is the first mention of the word hell in the Bible, and as the Bible is its own dictionary, it actually contains a lot of doctrinal information about hell right here in this one verse. If you look, he says, for a fire. Hell is fire. It's burning. It's literal fiery punishment. Romans 14, I'm sorry, Revelation 14, 10 and 11, he talks about those that take the mark of the beast. It says that they, uh, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night. When you get in there, that's not resting, it's not hanging out, there's no party in hell. You're down there being tortured, you're on fire. This is very important. Notice it says a fire is kindled in mine anger. Anger tells us this is the judgment of God. God said this, and you rejected him, and you went after another God. You didn't have any faith. He says, I'm angry at you now. Now you're going to be punished. You'll be judged. Also, if you notice, he says, for a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. You say, there are multiple hells? Well, in a sense, there's only one place called hell, and there's different levels inside of it. And I'm not talking about the heretical Dante's Inferno. I'm talking about what the Bible teaches. He actually warned the Pharisees that they had essentially a hotter hell. He says they had a greater damnation because of they were deceiving and manipulating and tricking people and lying to them and stealing from them. They were false prophets that knew who God was and hated God, rejected Him, and they preached a false gospel. So there is a hotter hell for the false prophets and the manipulators, right? Just as much as there is a greater resurrection, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, for those that lay down their life for Christ while they're here. So a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase. This is interesting. Uh, notice he says, um, consume the earth. You know, one day God will literally destroy this earth. In the book of Peter, he tells us that it is reserved unto fire of the day of judgment. There's a day of judgment coming, and one day this earth, it says it will melt with a fervent heat. It will melt like a candle and disappear. And when that happens, there's a judgment, there's a new heaven and new earth for those that are saved, and the hell is cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Look at that. It says, it's consumed the earth with her increase. Increase. You know what that means? It's always growing. Since we've been talking here this morning, there's probably been hundreds of people worldwide that have died and gone to hell. Constantly increasing. It's interesting that in Isaiah 5, verse 14, when it talks of hell, it says that um, it says, hell hath enlarged herself. It's getting bigger and bigger. Now, I have a little theory about that. I believe that if hell is expanding and it's in a literal place in the center of the earth, then the earth is expanding 
And they've already observed somehow that there's this expanding universe theory that it seems that everything keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so I think that's because of hell. I think because the souls are going into hell and she hath enlarged herself and earth is enlarged. And they know that uh, from California to Japan, that ring of fire, it continues to get bigger. And they know that the stars are getting farther apart. And I think it's all because it's all God's time clock. And when the time is up and hell is full, the judgment will come. Notice he tells us the place. He says, uh, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase. Look, and it says, And set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now, what's the foundation of the mountain? If I said, What's the foundation of this pulpit? You would say, Well, that's the stage, or that's the ground, right? Well, the foundations of the mountains, it's the earth, and underneath the earth, in the heart of the earth, as the Bible says, is hell. It's literally a physical place right now in the center of the earth. And when this earth melts away, this spiritual place that's a ball of fire will be cast into the lake of fire. If you would, go to Luke chapter 16, please. Go to Luke chapter 16. I want to show you a prayer from hell, or you could call it a sermon from hell. The, uh, nihilism is a false religion that has it's not like an organized religion now imagine if everybody believed in nothing they probably couldn't get together and agree on anything you know what i'm saying like we come together in the name of christ and we come together because we believe in the baptist distinctives and we come together because we do believe that god can preserve his word and we have certain things we agree on we believe in eternal security once saved always saved we believe in salvation by faith alone and not by works and we have things that we grow together on because we agree and there's some other things maybe you're a little bit different than i but that's okay but the foundations we have are all the same and we come together on what's the same well imagine a bunch of nihilists what do you believe nothing do you agree with anybody nobody what do you think everything's going to turn into absolutely nothing just disorder and chaos and it's like man that's kind of a what a poor way to look at life now, you know i mean i always what's that what was that character eeyore Oh me, oh bother, the world is terrible. You know, there was one on Charlie Brown too. What was, the, was it Linus? It always had the cloud over his head. I mean, listen, if you have no hope in heaven and nothing is your, your future, well, I guess you didn't get excited about anything. Think about this, guys. Somebody that believes in nothing and they have no hope for the future, can they have true joy? Now, they can have moments of pleasure which is far different than true joy. Isn't that right? You guys are in Luke 16. Before I start there, let me just tell you, the doctrine of hell is denied by most religions. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses deny hell. And of course, uh, Charles Taze Russell, he got that from the Adventists. And the Seventh-day Adventists, they believe in a soul sleep and not really hell. And some would say, well, it's just like when you get there, then you just burn up and you're consumed and it doesn't last at all. Um, who else? Let's see. Uh, rabbinical Judaism. Now, Orthodox Judaism, they, they believe in uh, the Moses and they believe in a hell because we just read out of Deuteronomy. But the vast majority of rabbinical Judaism, modern Judaism, they totally reject an eternal hell. They don't believe it exists at all. Uh, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, uh, the Hebrew roots movement, especially, uh, which is Talmud, or well, Talmudism is one, but Torahism is another, where they believe in the law, we keep the law to be saved. Most of these religions don't believe in hell. Many mainstream Christian religions, if you try to pin them down, they don't believe in hell. Now, uh, I, I was speaking to a Pentecostal yesterday, and he believes in hell, but he, ha he believes he has to work his way into heaven. So that guy's lost until he figures it out. Pentecostalism uh, is a very big umbrella, if you will, or the tongues movement. And a lot of them, their very leaders, do not believe in hell. But mo I mean, most of these guys, they're not just not saved. They are wicked false prophets that teach very bizarre doctrine. Most of, there are a lot of Christians that deny that hell is eternal. They believe in Nothing. They're living for the moment. I tell you, in the King James Bible, hell occurs 54 times. One of the closest Bibles to the King James Bible is the Webster Bible, and it deletes hell five times. 
in a very key area that's almost like, why would you do that? Why would you change it to the place where the dead go? Or why would you change it to the grave when it's talking about eternal fire in context? Doesn't make sense, right? Well, we went back to the Hebrew and we looked up this word Sheol and we looked up with Hades and we went with, and they start giving you dictionary definitions to justify changing hell. Hell is real, it's fire, it's forever, it's in the center of the earth. Now, the New King James, a lot of people are confused and think it's just as good. Um, it only uses the word hell 35 times. It's 54 in your Bible. New King James, 35. NLT, 18. NIV has it 15 times. ESV, 17. John MacArthur's new legacy standard or study Bible, standard Bible, 14 times. Not only does he change the name of God, he deletes hell. Now, you're in Luke 16. Look at this in verse number 19. Luke 16, please find verse number 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, Abraham's bosom, this is a sermon for another time, but it is not a place. There are people that believe it's a place that comes out of the Talmud. It's not a biblical doctrine. A bosom is a chest. And what he's talking about, he gave Abraham a hug. Genesis 16 and Luke 16 are the only places that mention Abraham's bosom. And both of them, like Hagar went into his bosom, she gave him a hug. Here it's saying, when you get to heaven, you're going to see the greats that have gone on before you, and you're going to give some of them hugs. Here, this, this Lazarus wanted to hug Abraham. Well, the rich man died also. Look at verse 23, and he says, And in hell, lift up his eyes. Now, here, notice this. Immediately. It did not say his soul went to sleep. It did not say a thousand years passed and then he ended up in hell. No, no. When you depart from this body, when you're absent from the body, you're either present with the Lord or as in Luke 16, 23, in hell, you lift up your eyes being in torment. It was immediate. He goes to hell. He suffers immediately. Verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Here we have the same characteristics. It's down there, it's hot, it's torture. And there's no water, there's no pleasure. Now, I have a, ha a hell handout. If I could get a couple young men. If I could get a couple young men to share that, please. I want you to look at this handout because, again, this doctrine of hell is under attack. It's real. We're not going to go through the whole handout now. It's something for you to take home and study for yourself and be fully persuaded on your own. If you need some strengthening verses, here's a Bible study for you, okay? Um, he says, have mercy on me, send Lazarus. So now here's the poor guy that just begged at his gate. And he says, Can you, I know that guy. I gave him crumbs. Will you send him just to give me one little drop of water? I'm so hot, I just desire a little bit of water. What an interesting statement, how terrible hell must be. If dead men could speak, what would they say? Well, this rich man, as he's in hell, is saying, please give me some water. Please have some mercy on me. In hell, he lift up his eyes. He's crying, have mercy on me. I am tormented in this flame. This is the sermon from hell. Don't come here, he's saying. Oh, it's hot. Oh, I am tormented. On this handout that you have, the biblical doctrine of hell. Who? It's unsaved people. What? everlasting fire and punishment when it's everlasting from creation to the lake of fire where the location is down in the center of the earth obviously until this earth is destroyed why the punishment for sin without accepting the gift of forgiveness listen here's the good news you don't have to go to hell jesus would petition you and beg you please take the gift please don't go to hell don't come here how 
How to avoid hell? Just trust Jesus. You know, He paid for all your sins. It's complete. It's interesting, He even went to hell. It doesn't tell us exactly what He did there. We do know there was a picture of it, a foreshadowing and prophecy of that the burning lamb, etc. But just as Jesus in, uh, what is it, Daniel 3, where there was the Son of Man in the midst of the fire, he, they weren't consumed by the fire. I doubt that Jesus was consumed in hell. But in Acts chapter 2, verse 31, it says, He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that His soul was not left in hell. On the day that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, he was buried. For three days he's in the grave. It tells us that he went down to El. He says he went to the heart of the earth. He says it was the sign of Jonah. There's all these indications he went to hell. He, can, he comes up victorious. In Revelation it says he has the keys of death and of hell. You don't have to go there. He can lock that door so you never have to walk through it. Just as much as he can open the door to salvation. He's conquered death and hell. He has victory over death and hell. He wants to give you the gift of God, which is eternal life. It's the forgiveness of all your sins, so you don't go to hell. Do you believe that? Jesus paid it all. Continuing in Luke chapter 16, if you would look at verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You say, what's heaven like? Oh, we're going to be comforted, right? What's hell like? Well, you're going to be tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Just as much as God put the oceans as boundaries for the continents, he has put boundaries from heaven and hell. It is a spiritual area that is off guards. And uh, when you're in heaven, you can't go to hell. And when you're in hell, you can't go to heaven. But God being omnipresent, He is everywhere. He says, if you make your bed in hell, behold, I'm right there. He's going to see you in hell if you go there. Wouldn't you rather be comforted by Him in heaven? Verse 27, we're listening to the sermon from hell, the message from hell that dead men could, if they could speak. Verse 27, and he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Would your family cry from hell for a soul winner to come by your house and preach the gospel? You say, perhaps I have a brother in hell. I have a brother that's passed and he's dead and he's down there. And if he could talk to me, if he could pray and God would answer it, if he could preach a sermon and I would hear it, it would be, don't come here. Please testify to my family. Don't come here. You don't have to. The problem is we're often too hard-hearted. We want to do it our own way. We reject the gift of God, which is eternal life. Would your family cry from hell? God gave us one sermon from hell. God gave us one prayer from hell, and we're reading it now. The message is this. Preach to the lost. Don't come here. It's hot. It's torture. It's torment. Don't come here. Stay away. Verse 29. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now this is strong. He says they've got the Word of God. If they would just listen to the Bible, they have Moses and all the prophets, and they warned them about hell. They said it's a real place. Hey, who went there that we saw in Deuteronomy 32? It was the children who have no faith. They picked another God. Any God but Jesus. You end up in hell. They have the Bible. God gave His testament for all people. Read it. Believe it, trust in Him, and you won't go there. Verse 30, And He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said, if somebody would come up from the dead and resurrect, it would be a miracle. And then when they saw that, they would change their mind. They would turn and say, Whoa, he, He's from the dead, and He's speaking about Jesus. We've got to change our mind about salvation. Verse 31, And He said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets... Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Even if they saw that miracle, they may not. If you would go to Jude chapter 1, and we're going to finish there. Jude chapter 1, that's right before the book of Revelation. 
Jude chapter 1. While you're going there, allow me to read 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 11. Listen to this. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing that hell is hot, we preach to people. We compel people. We persuade people. We convince them, trust in Jesus and don't go there. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. He says, you have that still small voice inside of you. You have your own conscience and your own spirit and your own ideas and your own doctrine. And he says, in your own heart be fully persuaded. Be convinced. Let the Holy Spirit prick your heart and tell you, don't go to hell. Hell is no joke. Hell is not a joke. Halloween, it, uh, it looks fun, and they're going to give you that corn syrup candy that will give you a headache tomorrow and a bellyache. But hell is no joke. It's not a laughing matter. In Jude chapter 1, if you would with me, look at verse number 22. These are great verses to memorize. Please commit them to your memory. And of some have compassion making a difference. That means some people, they'll get saved because you love them and you help them see things differently. Of some have compassion making a difference and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Pulling them out of the fire. That's like scaring them to death. I use the illustration. It's like rattling somebody's cage because they don't even know they're in a cage and you rattle it and you say, you're in a cage, man. Get out of it. You're going to die and go to hell. We can save with fear. We can scare the hell out of somebody just by telling them the pure truth. It's a Bible doctrine. God is true. He loves you. He's not willing that any should perish. He does not glory when you go to hell. He's not proud of those that would die and go to hell. He's not happy. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by flesh. Listen to me, Christians. Those of you that are saved... You say, I get it, Pastor Fannin. Hell's real and it's scary. Thanks for the refresher. So what do I do? These last few verses are an instruction for you for your lifestyle. It says, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. The garment spotted by flesh. He's dealing with sin. He says, if you, want to, if you really want to persuade some of some having compassion and others save with fear, then you better hate the sin in your life. That doesn't mean go out there and, and preach at the pervert parades and tell them they're going to hell. No, no. You look in the mirror and you say, I'm a sinner and I'm weak in certain areas and I need to get better in certain areas and I need to have compassion to the those that need compassion and I need the scriptures in my heart to preach the fear and I need a perfect balance in God. And he says, hate the sin in your own life and then God can use you to keep people out of hell. What a beautiful thing. Listen, guys, hell is not a joke. Nihilism is a strange religion that's not even a religion because it means nothing, right? Uh, Nihilationism has infiltrated Christianity, but really a lot of the Christian cults, the SDAs, the LDS, the JWs, etc. Hell is real. It lasts forever. It's fire. And here's the best part. You don't have to go. God loves you so much, He paid for it all. Won't you take the gift? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for this uh, beautiful morning. And Lord, thank You for all those that came to Sunday school this morning. Lord, I pray that this would motivate us and encourage us to help others and to warn them that they don't have to go. Lord, we love You, and I pray that You give us an awesome day here. Lord, I pray that You would help us to worship You in spirit and in truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.